Congress returns to work next week after spending the summer ignoring the Zika outbreak in Florida and Puerto Rico. Among its critics, New Jersey's senior Senator Bob Menendez. Here to talk about that and other issues. Senator, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Mike. First of all, I want to ask, how's your daughter? Five months pregnant in Miami. How's she doing? Well, she's doing well, taking care of herself, but totally disappointed and frustrated that her government isn't doing what is necessary to take care of her and her unborn child. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's so, it's, uh, as, as her parent, as her father, it's so, uh, you know, frustrating to me that, you know, in the Senate we negotiated a compromise from the president's $1.9 billion emergency funding for Zika down to $1.1 billion, passed it in the Senate in May, only to see it languishing in the House of Representatives where they went out of recess without even bringing it up because they wanted to introduce things like, you know, no money for family planning and whatnot, even though Zika can be transmitted through sexual intercourse. So the reality is, is that it is so frustrating. And, uh, you know, I, I just hope when we go back next week that uh, we can make the House come to their senses. How do you do that, though? If, if they don't see the light here in the peak of mosquito season in places like Florida and throughout the country. How, how do you convince them to say, we need to address this issue now? Well, I think we need, uh, you know, a national outcry. Every time that I talk about uh, Zika before a different group and uh, women automatically uh, are concerned, you know, women, even those who aren't pregnant, but understand having gone through a pregnancy and whatnot and the, the, the joy and sometimes the challenges of having a child. Uh, understand that to add this as a worry would be incredible. The cost to us as a nation for every child who's infected with the Zika virus through encephalitis. Uh, and, and well, uh, I, I just hope that uh, Adley Stevenson's admonition that when I get the heat at home, I see the light in Washington is going to take place for those members of Congress and the House of Representatives who haven't acted. The Obama administration has been taking money from other programs, e Ebola funding and other programs. I understand your colleagues in the Senate, Langford, Grassley uh, of Ohio, talking about some $20 billion unspent money in the State Department's budget that, given a 15-day notice, can be used for things like fighting Zika. Has anyone asked for that other than uh, Langford or Grassley uh, talked about that amount of money or at least portion well, of it? Well, the problem is, is that we're, you know, uh, taking from serious, it may be unspent money, that doesn't mean it's uncommitted money. You know, we're fighting malaria in different parts of the world. We're fighting, uh, still dealing with the overcoming Ebola uh, in Africa. Uh, there are other challenges as well. And as we've seen, disease knows no boundaries or, or barriers. Uh, and so this is not just being good to the world, it's being good in our own interests at the end of the day to stop those diseases from reaching our, our shores. So, you know, the essence of the nation, when, when I hear my co Republican colleagues talk about defending the American people, well, yes, it's from ISIS and it's from foreign, you know, challenges, but it's also from disease. And it seems to me that the emergency of Zika needs an emergency response. The sooner we can get a vaccine created, the better off we will be. We've lost time. We've lost time. Let's talk about uh, the flights to Cuba, commercial flights that resumed yesterday for the first time in, in more than 50 years, direct flights from the U.S. to, to Cuba. Uh, you oppose that. Tell me why. Well, because all we're doing is enriching the Castro regime at the expense of human rights and democracy. So if we could uh, create, for example, business opportunities with the average Cuban person, if the average Cuban person was free to decide, you know, that I want to start up a little uh, business, a little barbershop, a restaurant, a repair shop, uh, and be able to profit from that, and then because of their economic freedom, see greater freedoms from the government, that might be a catalyst. But all that's happening here is that in Cuba, there are only two main entities that you can deal with. Both are controlled by the Castro regime. One one is controlled by Castro's son. The other one is controlled by his son-in-law. Both of them part of the Cuban military. Both of the profits from the proceeds go to the Cuban military. So we're actually propping up a regime that oppresses its uh, people and has actually been, since the president's initiatives, more repressive, more arrests have taken place, more beatings of human rights activists and political dissidents because they think the message is, we want to do business with you, we want to go to your beaches, and we're willing to let human rights and democracy fall by the wayside. So what would you want to see to make it, uh, make it acceptable to you to have relationships with, uh, uh, with, with Cuba, direct flights. The law uh, that I helped write several years ago makes it very clear. 
If the regime is willing to uh, free political prisoners, permit independent journalists like yourself, uh, ultimately hold uh, free elections, in which they can even run, by the way. If they can run and win, and that's what the Cuban people want, fine. Uh, but permit free elections, uh, similar to what President Obama did when, uh, you know, he uh, uh, was de dealing with Burma. He said, you have to free Eun Yong Su Yi. You have to allow the UN Commission on Human Rights in. You have to hold legislative elections. And then we can have a relationship with you. And guess what? That's exactly what Burma did. Uh, and so those are openings for free expression and democratic processes and human rights to be observed. I don't know why the people of Cuba deserved any less. Let's talk about it. I know you just came from a big ceremony talking about the deepening of New York Harbor. What's mm -hmm. that going to mean to this region? This is a project that I've been working on since I entered the House of Representatives. That was a long time ago. That's, that's a, <laughs> you know, a privilege to say it was 24 years ago. We had, uh, we have the mega port of the East Coast, but it was strangled by the fact that we couldn't get dredging permits so that the ships with the deep holes could come into the port. Uh, they were looking to go elsewhere to Halifax, Canada. This was 250,000 jobs at the time, uh, billions of dollars of economic activity that were going to be lost. And I convened a all parties uh, office meeting where I locked the door of my office and I said to the EPA, the Army Corps, NOAA, and the White House Environmental Quality Council, at that time it was uh, uh, the, uh, President Clinton's administration, I said, we're not leaving this office until we come in an agreement. And the long story made short is that we came to an agreement, we stopped dump dumping contaminated sediments into our ocean, we used them for beneficial reuse, so Ikea and places along the Newark airport that you see when you land, those were all beneficial reuses of dredged materials. We cut the backlog permits, and we had the greatest channel deepening project in the nation's history. And that means now 330,000 jobs from the port region over $25 billion of personal income, $55 billion of business income, and $7 billion in state, federal, and local tax revenue. So this is a tremendous economic burst and a great celebration of making and keeping New York and New Jersey the megaport of the East Coast. I'm looking forward to reap some benefits there. All right, thank you, Absolutely. Senator. Thank you.